EWTN's Cathedrals Across America presents from the Co-Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist in Rochester, Minnesota, the massive installation of the Most Reverend Robert E. Barron as the Ninth Bishop of Winona, Rochester.
Archbishop of St. Paul in Minneapolis, and on behalf of the, the bishops and the faithful and the consecrated men and women of the province of St. Paul in Minneapolis, delighted to be here today to really welcome you, Bishop Barron, to our province, and uh, certainly here to this wonderful uh, uh, diocese of Winona, Rochester. We as bishops have been here on many occasions to celebrate, and we've always appreciated so greatly the hospitality that's been offered by our brother, Bishop Quinn. So it's wonderful, Bishop, to be able to uh, be with you on this day as well, this great day for this diocese, and now to uh, welcome you to say a few words. This is my special honor and joy to be able to welcome Archbishop Christophe Pierre. This is his second pastoral visit to our diocese here of Winona, Rochester. A few years ago, Archbishop came and he erected St. John Church as our co-cathedral, and we rejoice. And so what a joy this is for us to welcome him again. But also I want to thank him for all also being our honoree and main speaker for our annual seminary dinner. And even though And so it's with great joy that as soon to be Bishop Emeritus, that I am able to welcome our Apostolic Nuncio, who is the personal representative of our Holy Father. Welcome Pierre. Thank you, Bishop Emeritus, soon to be. <laughs> Not yet. See Cardinal Harvey today. It's the first time I see you, for, and I've been around uh, for six years in most of the cathedral, but I've never seen you in a cathedral, so I'm happy to you. You know, we Cardinal Supic. Your Excellencies, Archbishop Gomez, Chairman of the Bishops' Conference, Archbishop Lucas, Archbishop Hebda, Bishops and ordinary bishops. As we come together today in this co cathedral of St. John the Evangelist, we must give thanks to Bishop Queen, who first in 2000 of the combined diocese of Winona Rochester. You know, it's a long story, in uh, 2018. Bishop Queen's pleasant disposition served spirit to the people he has served throughout this ministry here. We thank you. Thank you.
But now the time has come for you, Bishop Baron. You know, I was always a bit puzzled about you, uh, Bishop, because, you know, you only... I don't know why they added another one, but anyway. That's so the you, now it has time for you to leave the good people of the sunny Santa Barbara and don't when that we bishops very often must become accustomed to holding on to our old wardrobe since you never know when you might be using it in if you an uplifting spirit and you have endeared yourselves to countless numbers of people who thirst and hunger to satisfy themselves with one and you we know that you will continue your good work in this diocese of Winona Rochester. May I say that I believe that the core of your ministry photo for these are the reported words about one of your great mentors, Thomas Aquinas. We know that the Dominican tradition has told us said in return for his writings about him. It was like a kind of, kind of business, like mentality, you know. The clear response, Lord, nothing except us all. We should want only the Lord before anyone or anything. May your witness as a good shepherd and your preaching and writings always and missionary discipleship continue to bear great fruit and may the people of God always find much joy and consolation through Bishop Baron. As you know, it is written in Latin. The letter will be shown to you by Bishop Baron himself. This is a translation. Francis, Bishop, servants of the venerable Triana in Mauritania and auxiliary of the Archdiocese of the Los Angeles in California. Appointed Bishop of the Diocese of Winona, Rochester, greetings and apostolic blessings. And who renews his children with all attentiveness and care, guiding them in new directions, advises us so that in the Lord, Everything accordingly, considering at this time the spiritual needs of the flock of Winona Rochester, which, owing to the resignation of our venerable brother John, we brother who in the exercise of your responsibility of, as auxiliary of the community of Los Angeles are, in our judgment, and all with both the spiritual and the youth, consultation with the Congregation for Bishops, by the fullness of our apostolic authority, we release you from the bond 
of the aforementioned titular church and the office of auxiliary appoint and imposing the relative obligations which are connected to this mandate. It is our desire that you inform the clergy and the people of this our as a father to be loved, a teacher to be heeded, and a guardian to be supported. You heard that. <laughs> Finally, venerable brother, the Lord to carry out your entire ministry in wisdom and charity, and indeed, little by little, to be lifted up to kind-heartedness through humility. Second, our pontificate, and it is signed Pope Francis.
here to greet Bishop Barron are Scott Sherman, Mayo of Winona, and Allison Zelms, City Administrator for the City of Rochester. Sister Tierney Truman, President of Rochester Sisters of St. Francis. Sister Mary Andrea of the Religious Sisters of Mary and Brother Frank Carr of the Christian Brothers, representing the many religious brothers and sisters of our diocese. Dr. Gianrico Faruja, President and CEO of Mayo Clinic, and his wife, Geraldine. The Dilma and Rosalia Velasquez family, originally from Guatemala, now living in Worthington, representing the Hispanic community. John Bolcock, Assistant Director of Student Activity at Minnesota State University, Mankato, accompanied by students Max Widener and Elizabeth Cahill. Dr. Ravinder Singh and Mrs. Heidi Rehal, members of the Sikh community, 
and Rabbi Michelle Werner of the B'nai Israel Synagogue. Jeff and Catherine Torborg and their children representing Catholic education and the schools in our diocese. Reverend Norman Wall of Bethel Lutheran Church, and Reverend Elizabeth Larson, Director of Spiritual Care at Mayo Clinic, representing our broad ecumenical community.
us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that the example of your saints may spur us on to a better life, so that we who celebrate the memory of Saints Martha, Mary, and Lazarus may also imitate without ceasing their deeds. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this message came from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand in the court of the house of the Lord and speak to the people of all the cities of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Whatever I command you, tell them and omit nothing. Perhaps they will listen and turn back, each from his evil way, so that I may repent of the evil I have planned to inflict upon them for their evil deeds. Say to them, thus says the Lord, if you disobey me, not living according to the law I placed before you, and not listening to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I send you constantly, though you do not obey them, I will treat this house like Shiloh, and make this the city to which all the nations of the earth shall refer when cursing another. Now the priests, the prophets, and all the people heard Jeremiah speak these words in the house of the Lord. When Jeremiah finished speaking, all that the Lord bade him speak to all the people, the priests and prophets laid hold of him, crying, you must be put to death. Why do you prophesy in the name of the Lord? This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate and deserted. And all the people gathered about Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Lord, in your great love. 
lectura de la carta del apóstol San Pablo a los Gálatas. Hermanos, no permita Dios que yo me gloríe en algo que no sea la cruz de nuestro Señor Jesucristo, por el cual el mundo está crucificado para mí y yo para el mundo. Porque en Cristo Jesús de nada vale el estar circuncisado o no, sino el ser una nueva criatura. Para todos los que vivan conforme a esta norma y también para el verdadero Israel, la paz y la misericordia de Dios. Es palabra de Dios. Jesus entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat behind the, beside the Lord at his feet, listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with March serving, came to him and said, Lord, do you not care? that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving. Tell her to help me. The Lord said to her in reply, 
Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Well, good morning, everybody. I am delighted to be with you today, and my heart is overwhelmed with joy and with gratitude to everybody today. You know, I think first of Pope Francis, my gratitude to him for gracing me with the appointment as Bishop of the Winona Rochester Diocese. Gratitude to Cardinal Harvey and to Cardinal Supic, to Archbishop Gomez, Archbishop Hebda, Archbishop Listecki, Archbishop Lucas. Bishop Quinn, of course, my illustrious uh, predecessor, now Bishop Emeritus, huh? It's, it's just happened. <laughs> I'm grateful to all my brother bishops and priests who've joined me today. And can I just uh, highlight, it won't by name, but there are three bishops here whom I taught in the seminary. Do you want to know the definition of feeling old? That's it. Grateful, too, of course, to my family and friends, all those who have inspired me and shaped me and supported me over the years. Gratitude to all those who've come from near and from far, from Chicago and Santa Barbara and Cardinal Harvey from Rome to be here today. And I'm just delighted that this installation falls on the feast of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, declared as such by Pope Francis just um, last year. Remember, it used to be just the feast of St. Martha. But how wonderful that all three of the siblings, dear friends of Jesus, are now included. In the Gospels, we hear a good deal about the crowds of people who followed the Lord, about the 72 whom he sent, about those whom he healed and taught, indeed, a lot about the 12. But we don't hear much about his personal friends, with the exception of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. But see, everybody, the whole point of the Christian life is to become a friend of Jesus. At the Last Supper, the Lord told his apostles, I no longer call you servants, but friends. How extraordinary that statement is. Of course, we relate to him as penitent to Lord, as disciple to master, but at the culmination of the spiritual life, we relate to him as a friend. St. Bernard, Catherine of Siena, too, expressed this ascent symbolically as moving from the kiss of the feet, that's the penitent, the kiss of the hand, that's the disciple, to the kiss of the mouth, the kiss of friendship. And since Jesus is divine, it means the ordinary goal of the Christian life is to become God's friend. Well, it seems to me the task that's been entrusted to me today by the Holy Father is to facilitate the process by which the people of this diocese become ever more deeply friends of Jesus. Whatever teaching and sanctifying and governing I do here is subordinated to that great end, intensifying your friendship with the Lord. And we can see what this looks like concretely by examining our three saints for today. First, Mary, who sits attentively at the feet of Jesus listening to his word. She represents the path that spiritual teachers call finding the center. She knows that Jesus stands at the absolute pivot of her life, her concerns, her activities. She's rooted. She's grounded. 
Everything else in her life revolves around her relationship with Christ. She's like the central medallion in a rose window, the still point around which the entire beautiful design is organized. Now, the first thing we learn about St. Martha is that she doesn't quite get this principle. While Mary listens attentively to Jesus, Martha's about all the details of hospitality, so she complains. Tell her to help me. Just a hint, everybody, you know all is not well with your spiritual life when you find yourself telling God what to do. <laughs> but notice, please, how Jesus corrects her. He does not upbraid her for being busy with hospitality. Rather, he says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and upset about many things. Mary, he explains, has chosen, as the lovely Latin version of this has it, the unum necessarium, the one thing necessary. Mary's found the center. Martha, at this point, is still divided. Now, that she's learned this lesson thoroughly. See, we don't hear what happens after this dialogue with Jesus, but I think we can find out she does learn the lesson. It's revealed in the account of the raising of Lazarus in the Gospel of John. There, Martha utters a confession of faith that rivals that of Peter in the Synoptic Gospels. Jesus refers to himself as the resurrection and the life, and he asks Martha whether she believes this. And she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. It's a magnificent confession of faith. Having found that center in Jesus, having found at last the unum necessarium, Martha can now assume with enthusiasm her customary task of service. As such, she represents another key dimension of friendship with the Lord, loving and caring for those whom Jesus loves. As for our third saint, we never hear a word out of the mouth of Lazarus in the Gospels. His name, however, is eloquent. Eleazar, so Lazarus being the Latinized version of this, Eleazar has the sense of the one whom God has helped. And the great truth proclaimed, of course, is that Jesus has helped him in the most dramatic way possible, raising him from the dead. And because of this, we are told, and this is the key, I think, because of this, many came to believe in Jesus. Lazarus represents, therefore, a third great dimension of friendship with Jesus, namely evangelization. Once you've found that friendship, once you've been healed, you become a source of friendship and healing for others. The most effective evangelists are those whom God has helped, who've been brought back to life by Jesus. Lazarus, come out, and the dead man came out. Untie him, said Jesus, and let him go free. As anyone in this room who's ever followed my writings and speaking knows, I am all in favor of knowing the faith, being able to articulate it well intellectually. But those whom Jesus has liberated and untied will most powerfully convey the truth of Jesus to others. One of my favorite definitions of evangelization applies here. Quote, one starving person telling another starving person where to find bread. There's a delicious legend, I'm sure the nuncio knows it, that if not true, should be, as the Italians say. <laughs> According to this story, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, along with Joseph of Arimathea, were sent out by sea by enemies of the faith, made to drift on the Mediterranean with no sails or oars or supplies. They came to rest finally on the southern shore of present-day France, Lazarus, the legend goes on, became a powerful evangelist and the first bishop of Marseille, in whose cathedral his skull is venerated to this day. Again, if not true, it should be true. The spiritual point remains. The one whom Jesus called back to life evangelizes best. Now, with those three saints in mind, Pope Benedict said something that's always struck me as profoundly illuminating. The church, he said, does three basic things. It worships God, it serves the poor, and it evangelizes those three things. 
In a word, it does the work of Mary, of Martha, and of Lazarus. If you want to know my program for the Diocese of Winona, Rochester, that's it. Now, to speak of the worship of God is to speak of the Mass, the Eucharist, the sacraments, sacramentals, benediction, private prayer, the Liturgy of the Hours. It is to speak of monks, nuns, mystics, and contemplatives, all those who sit attentively at the feet of Jesus. I want a diocese that worships God with enthusiasm, devotion, and deep love. In terms of the form of that worship, the Pope's recent letter on the liturgy reflects very much my own mind, neither an experimental progressivism nor a repudiation of the reform of the liturgy called for by Vatican II. But I, I want to point to something deeper than just the form of worship. Because we live in a society, we all know this, that's largely forgotten how to worship God at all. Or perhaps to state it more clearly, has fallen into different forms of idolatry, false worship. Whatever one considers to be of highest value is what one worships. So sex and pleasure, money, power, worldly success, reputation, family, country, all of it becomes, for different people in different ways, objects of worship. The job of the church is to remind everybody that these idolatries will lead in short order to addiction and deep sadness, massive evidence of which is on display, I think, in a lot of young people today. It is furthermore the task of the church to model and to embody true praise, the right worship that serves to order both the self and the wider society. When the young Thomas Merton came to Gethsemane Abbey, for the first time for a Holy Week retreat, he told his diary, quote, I found the still point around which the whole country turns without knowing it. So our worship is indeed for ourselves, but it's also for the world. Just as the Jerusalem temple was meant to be a magnet to draw all the nations to the praise of the true God, so our worship should prove compelling to a society that's fallen into false worship. And now in relation to this theme, can I be very specific? And can I ask all the seminarians who are here, please, to stand? Here's some of the sem There they are. God bless you guys. St. John Paul II said eloquently enough, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, the church comes from the Eucharist. And of course, the Eucharist comes from priests. Hence, no priests, no church. And so if we want a church that vibrantly worships God, we need priests. Can I offer a challenge now to everybody here? It's not just for me, not just for the vocation director, not just for the clergy, it's for everybody in this diocese. How about we double the number of these guys in five years? No pressure on the vocation director. Where are you? I can see you. <laughs> there you are. God bless you. You guys can be seated. No pressure. No pressure. Just double in five years. That's all I want. <laughs> so the church worships God. It also, Benedict said, cares for the poor. It performs the work of Martha. Now, it carries out this task in numberless ways, caring for those who are poor economically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. We think of Catholic charities, prison ministries, Catholic hospitals, soup kitchens, those who visit the homebound. We recall Pope Francis' marvelous image of the church as a field hospital where the wounded are treated, where those on the margins, both economic and existential, as he puts it, are given aid. So I want our church here to be a place of refuge and in. And how can I, as I stand here, in the, literally in the shadow of the, of the Mayo Clinic, not see this connection, that the church be a source of healing, as this great city is a source of healing for the whole world. One of my heroes, my Chicago colleagues know this, is Monsignor Reynold Hillenbrand, who was one of my predecessors as rector of Mundelein Seminary back in the 1940s. Inspired by the leaders of the liturgical movement, Hillenbrand saw the intimate connection between what we do at Mass and the commitment to improve the lot of the poor the link, to put it simply, between liturgy and justice. 
The reconciliation with God that we find through the Eucharist should lead to a reconciliation with our neighbors and, yes, even with our enemies. And if I can make this even more concrete, can I suggest that we learn and practice the corporal and spiritual works of mercy? Another of my heroes is Dorothy Day, the co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement. Impatient with the overly abstract language about peace and justice that was heard so often, Dorothy Day said, quote, Everything a baptized Catholic does every day should be directly or indirectly related to the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Can I suggest, when I first read that line, it changed my life. That's one of those lines that gets down into your heart and soul and changes you. Everything we do every day should be directly or indirectly related to the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. The corporal works of feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, visiting the imprisoned, sheltering the homeless, caring for the sick, burying the dead. The spiritual works, admonishing sinners, instructing the ignorant. I used to tell my students at Mundelein, that's what I do, I instruct the ignorant. That's <laughs> even these three bishops here that I talk. <laughs> Counseling the doubtful, comforting the sorrowful, bearing wrongs patiently, forgiving injuries, praying for the living and the dead. I'd love our parishes here to be places where the corporal and spiritual works of mercy are known and vibrantly practiced. Now, I know those who know me, uh, one thing you know about me is that I'm a great fan of Bob Dylan, and here I'm in Bob Dylan's home state of Minnesota. But I'm not going to quote Bob Dylan, although there's a Bob Dylan song that quotes St. Martha. Do you know that? Ring them bells, St. Martha, for the poor man's son. Ring them bells so the world will know that God is one. So Dylan did quote our, our saint for today. But I want to draw attention to uh, another musical hero of mine, Johnny Cash. He was once asked why he performs so often in prisons. And he said, well, first, prisoners are the best audience. <laughs> but then second, he said, because I'm a Christian. That's a darn good answer. Jesus said, visit those in prison. Johnny Cash also resolved, after he became famous, and when he was always the most prominent person in the room, that he would always purposely seek out the person who looked the most lost or lonely or isolated. And on purpose, he'd make a beeline for him or her. I think that's a great Christian instinct and a great instinct for our parishes. Do we know who the neediest, loneliest, hungriest, and thirstiest people in our community are? Are we caring for them directly, personally, getting our hands dirty in the process? Thirdly, the church evangelizes. It does the work of Lazarus. Under this rubric, we include teaching and preaching, the maintenance of our schools and universities, the creative use of the media, engaging the questions of the culture, etc. As many of you probably know, a good deal of my ministry as both priest and bishop is centered around evangelization. Why do I feel so strongly about this? Well, first, because the Lord told us to do it. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. But secondly, because the need is so great in our time. Did you know that for every new Catholic who joins the church today, over six are leaving? Did you know the percentage of disaffiliation among Catholics under 30 is 50%? Half of our young Catholics are leaving the church behind. In the speech he gave at the general congregation prior to the conclave of 2013, Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio said he wanted a church that goes out from itself, even to the margins. Once elected pope, he told a group of priests that the oil of their ordination grows rancid unless it's allowed to flow to the ends of their garments and then out into the world. I do believe it's time for our parishes to become not simply places where Catholics are sanctified and instructed in the faith, as important as that is. They are to become centers of evangelization, places from which Catholics are sent out on mission. During the last priest convocation in Chicago that he would ever attend, Cardinal Francis George said something that uh, I've never forgotten. At the beginning of the church, he told the priests of Chicago, there was no Vatican, there were no dioceses, no parishes, no chancery offices, no basilicas or cathedrals, no Catholic schools or hospitals. 
But there were, he said, evangelists. If I were to emphasize any one of the three great tasks that I've outlined, I would emphasize evangelization as the most basic, the most central. Therefore, I'd like this local church to be a vibrantly evangelizing church. I'd like the focus to be first on those who are disaffiliating, especially among the young. What are we doing to reach them? How is every particular ministry in our parishes ordered toward the work of calling young people back home? That basic form will always be the Lazarus form. Show others how Christ has brought you back to life, how he's untied you and set you free. Okay, everybody, that's my program. <laughs> Worship God, care for the poor, and evangelize. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I promise, I pledge it to pray for all of you every day. Please pray for me. Established on the foundation of Jesus Christ and in communion with the church throughout the world, let us pray to God now for our own needs and for those of the entire people. Church, in particular for Pope Francis, Archbishop Pierre, and all bishops, that our faith may be strengthened by their teaching, and that holding to Peter the Rock, the Church may walk steadily through the storms of this world. Let us pray to the Lord. كنيستنا المحلية بالأخص لراعينا الجديد نيافة المطران بارون شاكرين لشهادة نيافة المطران كوين خلال السنين الماضية لذلك نعلن الخبر السار للخلاص ونبين رحمة الله للجميع Let us pray to the Lord राष्ट्रियों के नेताओं के लिए और विशेष रूप से हमारे नागरिक अधिकारियों और लोक सेवाओं के लिए ताकि वे उस जिम्मेदारी को पहचान सके जो भगवान उन्हें देता है और आम आचे के लिए काम करता है। Let us pray to the Lord. per tutti i sofferenti in corpo e spirito e per coloro chiamati ad alleviare la loro sofferenza. 
tramite l'intercessione di Maria, Salus in firmorum, possono ricevere la misericordia e la grazia della salute da nostro Signore Gesù Cristo. Let us pray to the Lord. Diócesis de Winona, Rochester, como protagonista de la nueva evangelización y en comunión con nuestro obispo, seamos un lugar en el que todos seamos bienvenidos y nos volvamos testigos del poder transformador del Evangelio. Let us pray to the Lord. sa mga biktima ng digmaan at karahasan, naway mapabilis ng Panginoon ang kapayapaan at katarungan sa mundo, ipagtanggol ang mga nasa panganib at mabigyan ng kaginhawaan ang mga nasasaktan. Let us pray to the Lord. Dada zetu waliyo kufa Ya kwamba kristo Kwa ufufuko wake Ainue mahekalu Ilio meili yao Let us pray to the Lord God, source of life and goal of all creation, hear our prayers and make this Eucharistic assembly a true witness of your cross and resurrection. We ask it through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join in our song for the preparation of gifts, Bread of Life, found on page 25. Change our hearts. 
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Pray, friends, that my sacrifice and yours might be acceptable to God, the Father Almighty. As we proclaim your wonders and your saints, O Lord, we humbly implore your majesty that as their homage of love was pleasing to you, so too our dutiful service may find favor in your sight. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right and just. it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For in the marvelous confession of your saints, you make your church fruitful with strength ever new. 
and offer us sure signs of your love, and that your saving mysteries may be fulfilled. Their great example lends us courage. Their fervent prayers sustain us in all that we do. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks. As an exaltation, we acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world. Together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, me, your unworthy servant, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them, we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them. For the redemption of their souls in hope of health and well-being and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmas and Damien, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands. And with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. <clears throat> In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, 
Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you've given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, and to accept them, as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel, the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, and to their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church 
and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Bernie, God bless you. Peace be with you. Thanks for being here today. Peace, Archbishop. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Peace, Pat. Thank you very much. Peace. Thanks for your help today. Peace. I know. Hey, John. God bless you. Peace be with you. Hey, Jerry. God bless you. Congratulations. Thank you. Hey, George. God bless you. Peace be with you. Jose. Hasta Cristo. Thank you. God bless you. Peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Please join in our communion hymn found at the bottom of page 28, Pan de Vida, page 28.
Let us pray. Holy reception of the body and blood of your only begotten Son, Lord, turn us away from the cares of this fallen world, so that following the example of Saints Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, we may grow in sincere love for you on earth and rejoice to behold you for eternity in heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We invite you uh, to the International Event Center. I think you're really aware of that. Moving out these doors, uh, to your right will be the buses, and they will be moving back and forth, and several of them there very much available. For the bishops, um, also there's a bus. If you're going to the reception, I know some of you need to leave immediately. There is a bus uh, near the rectory. And one more little thing, Bishop Barron. There is, a, you mentioned the Mayo Medical Community, and it's a, such a significant part of our city. And the Franciscan Sisters of Rochester, you know, began with this relationship yeah. with a handshake. Sister Lauren is here, and uh, she began working at St. Mary's Hospital before you were born. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> she works there 67 years, oh and this goodness. week she'll be 101. Uh. <laughs> She still has an office at the first floor of St. Mary's Hospital. I'll come visit. And she's always disappointed. She can't quite work a full day, but I'll work a half a day schedule. works. <laughs> Listen, everybody, can I just say a few words as we close? Again, of, of gratitude uh, to my senior man. Thank you so much for all you did to make this mass possible. Uh, to Andy Brandon, to everybody at the uh, Winona Pastoral Center. I'll be there Monday morning to work, but I know a, a lot of you have been working. Bless you for that. It was beautifully organized, and uh, and you were you greeted people with such enthusiasm and grace. So, yes, thank you for that. The choir, how magnificent you are. Uh, God bless you for your hard work in preparing for today. And you know, it's always a little bit dangerous when you start mentioning names because you're going to forget someone. And someone I, I know I, I forgot that I should mention is my predecessor, uh, Archbishop Vlasny. Um, I'm the ninth bishop, you were what, the sixth? The sixth bishop. Well, I met Archbishop Vlasny many, many years ago. It was the summer of 1980. I was a 20-year-old seminarian, and I was assigned to St. Aloysius Parish in Chicago. And uh, John, Father John Vlasny was there as pastor, and I, I mean this. There are spiritual and pastoral lessons you taught me that summer that I've never forgotten. So I'm very grateful to you as my predecessor and a spiritual mentor. God bless you. Y hermanos y hermanas, antes de ofrecer mi bendición final, quiero saludarles a todos aquellos que hablan español. Tuve muchas oportunidades cuando estuve en California de practicar mi español y tengo muchas ganas de continuar mi conexión con el pueblo hispano. Muchísimas gracias por su dedicación, por su compromiso, su dedicación al Señor. Es una fuente de inspiración para mí. Por favor, recen por mí. And I promise to pray for you. And with that... The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon all of you and remain with you forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Our song of sending can be found on page 32 of your booklet, Go Make of All Disciples. Mm -hmm.